Good morning, Citizens Church, and welcome to our online service. As we begin this morning in worshiping our King, I'd like to read to you from Psalm chapter 94. It says in Psalm chapter 94, in verse 19, in the multitude of my anxieties within me, your comforts delight my soul. As we begin this morning, and as we come to the Lord in worship, if there's anything within you, if you feel like there is a multitude of anxieties within you, I wanna encourage you to give those things to the Lord this morning. The Lord exhorts us to cast our burdens upon him. So let's do that this morning. As we come to the Lord, the Bible tells us that he will comfort and bring delight to our soul. We can trade our anxieties for comfort and delight when we come and we worship the Lord. Let's worship the Lord this morning. Father, we thank you, Lord, for our time this morning. And God, we ask, Lord, that you'd be with your people, Lord. You would calm the stress and the anxieties of life, God. Lord, we pray for the city of Edmonton, Lord, that your gospel would continue to go forth in power, God. Lord, we pray for the tithes and the offerings, Lord, that you would use them for the furtherance of your kingdom. Lord, we pray for the children of our church, Lord, that you would bless them, God, and they'd continue to, go, to grow strong in your word. We pray, Lord, for an opportunity to meet soon, Lord, that you would provide us a space, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for your, all your goodness. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray, amen. Let's worship the Lord.
good to us, God, and we're so unfaithful to you.
crushing and depressing you are making new wine in the soil I now surrender you are breaking the ground so I yield to you and to your careful hand and I trust you I don't need to understand Make me a vessel, make me an offering, make me whatever you want me to be. Came here with nothing, all you have given me, Jesus bring you wine out of me. In the crushing you are making me wine in the soil I now surrender you are breaking the ground so I yield to you and to your careful hand and I trust you I am For my soul, Father, you will never 
church if you would open up with me to James chapter 5 this morning and we are going to pick up in verse 7 if you want to follow along it says therefore be patient brethren until the coming of the Lord see how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth waiting patiently for until it receives its early and latter rain 
James says, you also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. In verse nine, he says, do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and you have seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. And he says in verse 12, but above all my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, lest you fall into judgment. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you, Lord, for our time this morning. And God, we ask, Lord, that you would instruct us on how to live righteously in these last days, God. We love you, Lord, and we look forward to you, Lord, your soon return. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. You notice there as we begin in verse 7, it says there, Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. I heard a story that took place during the Civil War in October of 1864. It was there that General Sherman and his army were encamped in the neighborhood of Atlanta. And it was there that he received marching orders to go and help at the Altoona Pass. It was at the Altoona Pass that a general by the name of General Corsi uh, and his brigade of 1,500 men were guarding, and they called it holding the fort, because there was a fort there that held a million and a half rations. But the Confederate army was on the move, and there was a group of 6,000 soldiers under the command of General French that were going to overtake the Altoona Pass uh, and those 1,500 soldiers under the command of General Corsi. The Confederate army arrived and surrounded uh, the 1,500 men very quickly and commanded them to surrender. These 1,500 men refused and fighting immediately broke out. The fighting became so intense that these soldiers were driven to the fort on the crest of the hill. And the saying went that they were going to hold the fort. The fighting became increasingly, increasingly worse. And as the men began to give up hope, one of them spotted across the valley on another mountain a signal. And so that they, they signaled back uh, to that mountain. And it was there that a message was being sent. And they were able to receive the message that read like this. Hold the fort. I am coming. W.T. Sherman. Cheers went up, the men took courage under the murderous fire, which killed or wounded more than half of the men in the fort. General Corsi himself was shot three times, but they held the fort for another three hours until General Sherman arrived and forced the Confederate army to retreat. Christian, the moral of that story is that we, it is too early, it is always too early to surrender to the enemy. The point that James is making here is that we are to hold the fort because the captain of our salvation, Jesus, is coming. And he is exhorting the believers that are living in the last days to hold the fort because Jesus is coming. The apostle Paul wrote to Titus in Titus chapter two, and he says to Titus that we are looking forward to the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and savior, Jesus Christ. This is the hope that Jesus is coming. And when Jesus returns, he is going to set things right and he is going to establish the kingdom of God. But in the meantime, what do we do? When we look around the chaotic state of the world, and we see, how the state of the, or we see how the world is in a chaotic state, just as how Jesus said it would be. James is going to instruct the believers this morning on how to hold the fort until our commander returns in Jesus. Notice he says, firstly, that we are to be patiently preparing. Notice in verse 8, he says, you be patient. And he says, establish, or that word might say, uh, in your translation, strengthen your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. 
There's an old joke I heard about a farm boy who was traveling along a road and a, his wagon load full of corn uh, was overturned along the road. Another farmer heard, hearing the commotion hustled out uh, to see what had happened and said, you know, I'm not sure if there's anything we can do right now. Why don't you come in and rest for a little while in my house? And the young farm boy said, I, I don't know if my dad's going to like that. He said, oh, come on, just come in for a little while. I, you know, you can rest, I'll feed you, and you can be on your way. Said, I, I don't know if my dad's going to like it. And he said, one more time, the farmer said, just come inside, I'll feed you, and you'll feel much better. The farm, farm boy reluctantly agreed and said, yeah, I, I don't know, I, I guess I will, but my dad's not going to like this. So after a while, the, the young farmer was in the uh, other farmer's house, and after supper, the, the young farmer leaned back in his chair and he said, you know, I really enjoyed my time with you and I enjoyed the meal and thank you very much, but I don't know if my dad's going to like this very much. And the old farmer sat up and said, well, where is your father? He said, he's back under the wagon. <laughs> and quite honestly, as I, read, as I heard that joke, that's quite honestly how many of us feel. There are days where we just feel like we've been under the wagon. There's days where we just promise after promise they have been broken and we just feel like we're being crushed under the weight of this world and the lord the 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 lord the lord is exhorting us here by james telling us he says to be patient with the circumstances of life james says be patient and listen i'm not a patient person this is just as much as a challenge for me as it is for you I come from a place that if you stop at a stop sign, that people look at you funny like it's your first time driving. In fact, if you've ever heard of that phrase, the California roll or the California stop, it's a real thing. People don't stop at stop signs because we're too impatient. But James is exhorting the believers here and he is exhorting me to be patient. And listen, we have to be patient especially patient with one another. You know, and there's something that is taking place while we are being patient. James says to establish or strengthen our hearts. The idea here behind strengthen or establish literally means to make firm or solid. It literally means to cause something to be inwardly firm and committed. And the basic idea of this word is to stabilize or supply support for something. And this is what James is doing. He's saying, hey, listen, there needs to be a stabilization. Your hearts need to be made firm. Because listen, the days in which we're living, it's chaotic. You know, our emotions are up and down. And James says, be patient, establish yourself, strengthen yourself in the Lord. Allow, your, allow the Lord to strengthen your heart. You know, one of the people in the Bible that I think of when you think of a situation uh, where they had to be patient and the Lord strengthened them. Do you remember a man by the name of Joseph? Uh, not Joseph, Joseph in the, in the book of Genesis. In the book of Genesis, there's a man by the name of Joseph. And at 17 years old, he is put in a dungeon in prison. And he absolutely committed no uh, no, he did no crime. Uh, a w woman came and said that he had raped her and he didn't and he is put in the dungeon for that and he's in there for so long that they actually make him the keeper of the prison. The warden comes to him and says, hey, you can have my job. You're in charge, boss. <laughs> You've been here for so long. You're, you have seniority. And he just, he's there for 13 years in the prison. And there's one instance where he's taken out of the dungeon after he interprets a dream and Pharaoh is struggling with this dream that no one can interpret and he's taken to the court of Pharaoh and he's there in the court of Pharaoh and he interprets his dream. And you know what Pharaoh says? He says, can we find anyone in whom the spirit of God is in this man? Pharaoh recognized that there was something in Joseph's life, Joseph's life that was in no other life. It was the Spirit of God. And listen, he could have been bitter. He could have said, man, I didn't deserve to go to prison. I shouldn't have been in the dungeon for the last 13 years. It was ridiculous. But he comes and Pharaoh recognizes that the Spirit of God is in this man's life. Listen, there is a day we're coming out of the dungeon. We're coming out of lockdown. 
And what will, be peop- what will people say about us? Will they say, yeah, I'm right there with you. I'm frustrated too. Or will they say, can we find anyone else in whom the spirit of God is in you? Listen, we, are, we have to be those that are being filled with the Spirit of God, that are being strengthened inwardly. You know, James says something very interesting at the beginning of his book in James chapter one in verse four. He says, let patience have its perfect work because there is a perfect work that takes place within the believer when we allow, when we are patient and we allow the Holy Spirit to work in our life. You know, it's interesting in I believe it's in the book of Isaiah. It says, those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. That implies that there, are, there has to be patience, that we have to be waiting on the Lord, that we have to sit in front of the Lord with an open Bible, and we have to be ready to hear from the Lord. There has to be patience on our part in order for strength to be renewed in our life, for the Lord to strengthen our hearts during these days. Can I ask you this morning, in a world that is melting, in whose hearts are melting in fear and frustration, what is the Lord doing to your heart? Is he strengthening your heart by the power of the Holy Spirit? Or is your heart like everyone else? Listen, this is a challenge for me as much as a challenge for you. Because there's times where I've been just, my heart has been so frustrated and I can't stand it anymore. But here, James challenges me and he challenges you to allow patience to have its perfect work and allow the Holy Spirit to work in each and every one of our lives. And you know why it's important? James says, because the coming of the Lord is at hand. Church, Jesus is coming soon. Let's allow the Lord to work within our hearts rather than getting frustrated with everything that is taking place in our day. Let's allow the Lord to work. Notice secondly, in the midst of waiting and being patient in the last days, James warns us of things that could spring up within our own life uh, that should not spring up. Notice he says, complaining against others. We read in verse nine, do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. He says, behold, the judge is standing at the door. I read a story of a woman by the name of Mrs. Higgins, who is described as an incurable grumbler. In fact, she was a potato farmer and she was, each and every year, she complained greatly about the crop of potatoes she got and she had never, uh, never had a good crop and she constantly was uh, getting rotten potatoes that she was having to feed to her pigs. Until one year, there was, uh, she had uh, a very good crop. In fact, some of the men in the town came to her and said, Mrs. Higgins, we hear that you have had a fantastic crop, uh, potato crop this year. She says, yeah, what about it? And they said, well, do you have anything bad to say about it? And she said, absolutely. Where am I going to get the rotten potatoes to feed my pigs? (laughs) It's so easy in the day and age in which we live to complain. There are a million things we can complain about. It has become so easy. We don't need any extra, you know, we don't even need to look at the news. We're already, we're already by nature good complainers. And then with all the other added things that is taking place in our culture, and listen, it is so easy to complain. And grumbling is something that we have to guard ourselves against, especially grumbling against one another. You know, honestly, one thing that I have noticed, personally, I've noticed that when I, or when somebody grumbles with another person, Oftentimes what happens is they end up grumbling against another person because they find out they don't share their same opinions. And the book of Exodus warns us about grumbling against others. In fact, Moses tells us, you remember when Moses led the people out of, uh, the, allowed, out of Egypt and they came to a place in Exodus chapter 16 called the wilderness of sin. Now, I bet you know how this is going to go. The people were complaining against Moses and they're complaining and constantly complaining against the leadership of Moses. And it was there that Moses warned the people in Exodus chapter 16 in verse 8. And he says, for, your, for the Lord hears your complaints, which you make against him. 
And he goes on and he says, your complaints are not against us. He says, but they are actually against the Lord. You know, one of the most painful mistakes that you can ever make is talking about someone behind their back. And what makes it even more painful is sometimes, you know, that person will walk into the conversation. You're like, oh, I didn't know you were here. I remember the last time I made that mistake. It was like 12 years ago where I was talking about someone and they walked in the room. I thought, oh no, this is bad. I don't ever, I'm never gonna do this again. I don't wanna talk about someone behind their back. This is painful. You know, James tells us here, or we know from the book of Exodus that we, when we grumble against another person, that we're actually grumbling against the Lord. And James tells us here that we are to be careful because the righteous judge is listening. He's standing on the other side of the door and he is listening to the complaints that we are making against the Lord. One of the things we just have to be careful of is grumbling against other people. You know, the Apostle Paul wrote to the Thessalonians and he instructed the Thessalonians on the return of Christ. And in the context of that passage in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 in speaking about the rapture of the church and the return of Christ, he tells us and he tells the Thessalonians that in everything, rather than complaining, he says, in everything, give thanks for this is the will of God. This is what is important, that we are giving thanks. You know, occasionally at our house, we find that our uh, dining room light will grow dim. Every once in a while, uh, we'll turn on our dining room light and it just becomes dim. And we found out the problem uh, last Christmas. We had, we had several lights that were uh, plugged in. I think we had a dehydrator uh, plugged in and all within the same area. And it was causing the brightness of the light in our dining room to go dim, even to flicker. It would like go on. It was like, are we living in a haunted house or what is going on? I don't, <laughs> maybe the dehydrator is possessed. I don't know. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but you know, you get the idea. There's too many things plugged in. That was the cause of making the lights dim or making the lights flicker. Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter five in verse 14, he says that we are the light of the world. And he says that we are a city that is set upon a hill and that cannot be hidden. One of the things that I find dims the brightness of God's glory in our personal lives is simply complaining. The Apostle Paul wrote to the Philippians and he said in Philippians chapter two, to do everything without disputing and complaining. Those are two areas that we seem to excel in. But he tells us not to do these things because while we live in the midst of a perverse and crooked generation, Paul tells us, he says that it is our goal at the end of Philippians 2.15 that, that we shine like lights to this world. Listen, one of the things that dims the brightness of God's glory coming through our personal lives is complaining. Let's be people, let's be God's people that are giving thanks rather than complaining in these last days. Notice as we continue on, James exhorts the believers of the last days uh, to, uh, to exercise perseverance. Notice he says in verse 10, he says, my brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord and as an example of suffering and patience. He says in verse 11, indeed, we count them as blessed who endured. But you, or he says, you have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is compassionate and merciful. One of the, you know, most of the times when we think of the Bible, people that were, uh, that were so blessed, oftentimes we focus on the blessing rather than their suffering. We think, man, they were so blessed, but we forget about what they had to suffer. In fact, when we get to heaven, I'm sure we're all gonna meet the Apostle Paul and we'll speak with the Apostle Paul. I know, you know, there'll be so many people that run to Paul and say, Paul, you were such a blessing. How were you such a blessing to so many people? And he would say, didn't you read what I wrote? Didn't you read how I was shipwrecked? 
Didn't you read about my suffering? Did you read I was beaten to death? I had to run for my life. I had to, you know, I could, you know, my eyes didn't work well. I had malaria. Didn't you read about what I wrote? All the suffering. See, out of suffering comes a blessing. And this is what James is speaking of here. He says, he gives us two examples of, of people that persevere. He speaks firstly of Job. Now, if you've, ever, ever, if you've never read the book of Job, it can be a job reading through the book of Job in the Old Testament, pun intended. Uh, but the story of Job is about a wealthy man by the name of Job, as you might imagine, who had several children. He had great wealth, but he was blameless and upright, and he was constantly mindful to live in a righteous manner before the Lord. And God tells Satan to consider Job's virtue, but Satan contends contends that Job is only righteous because God has blessed him so generously. And Satan dares God that if given the approval to inflict suffering upon Job, it will change Job and he will end up cursing God. And God permits uh, Satan to test Job and uh, but does not allow Satan to take Job's life. So over the course of a day, Job is given four reports, in each of them informing that his sheep, his servants, and his children have all died from natural disasters or uh, thieving uh, intruders, yet Job still praises the Lord. In fact, the, Satan comes once again and he oppresses Job by uh, giving him skin sores, and his wife even, Job's wife even comes and denounce, tells tells Job to denounce God and to give up, to curse God and die. Now, I've always found it amazing that Satan killed all of Job's children, but didn't kill Job's wife. I, she must have been an interesting woman. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> but he, he nevertheless, he lets her live. She tells Job, he says, hey, curse God. And Job says, no, I'm going to persevere and I'm going to trust the Lord. Even Job's friends come along and say, hey, you should repent because there's got to be some secret sin in your life. That's why I, you're going through so much suffering. And Job says, I haven't done anything wrong. And he continued to persevere through his trials. And eventually God restores Job's health, grants him twice as much property as before, new children, and remarkably a long life. And in the end, Job never completely gave up hope or faith in God as an inspiration to everybody who is enduring suffering of their own. Notice James also says, consider the prophets. You might say, what prophets? Well, how about Jeremiah? He was called the weeping prophet. In fact, Jeremiah was arrested as a traitor and he was thrown into a abandoned well to die. What about Daniel? You remember when they made a law, when they were trying to trap Daniel into making, they make a law that says you can't pray and Daniel ends up, he continues, like, I'm not gonna stop praying. Say, hey, we're gonna throw you to the lions. Okay, no big deal. I'm gonna keep praying. What about Elijah? Think about Elijah. Man, here is a guy that challenged the prophets of Baal in 1 Kings chapter 18 on Mount Carmel. If you've never read that story, you should read that story. It is a powerful, it is an incredible story where Elijah challenges all these prophets of Baal or Baal into basically, they're both going to build altars. And Elijah says, you call on your God, I'm going to call on my God. And whoever's God answers first by fire, we will know that their God is the true God. So all these false prophets of Baal, they start cutting themselves and they're starting to, you know, they're calling on their God to send fire from heaven. And finally, they're exhausted. In fact, Elijah's taunting them. <laughs> He's having a great time. And then they say, hey, we give up. Our God's not answering us. So Elijah, it says that he built an altar to the Lord and it says that he prayed and fire fell from heaven. Now, could you imagine if this was you, if you, if you went to the middle of Edmonton, you went to an open area where there, you know, there was a safe area and you said, hey, I'm gonna prove to you that my God, that Jesus is king and Jesus is gonna send fire from heaven and Jesus sends fire from heaven right in the middle of Edmonton and everybody is absolutely blown away. They witness it. It's on the news, it's on social media. Every, everybody has witnessed this event what would you do? You would think that there would be widespread revival, right? 
If God sent fire from heaven as a sign that he was, that Jesus was the true God, you would think, right? You know what it says in 1 Kings chapter 19, the beginning? It says that Elijah had to flee for his life. He had to endure and persevere through the tribulation. I love what Oswald Chambers, he says, and he makes a distinction between endurance and perseverance. And I love this. He says, perseverance is more than endurance. He says, perseverance is endurance combined with an absolute assurance and certainty that what we are looking for is going to happen. The apostle Paul said it this way. We glory in our tribulations. And he says that knowing that the tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance produces character and character produces hope. Friend, we have the hope that Jesus is coming back. And I wanna encourage you this morning. We're not persevering because of what is taking place around us. We're not persevering because of what, you know, our premier is saying what, you know, our, uh, what the chief medical people are saying and no disrespect to them, but we're, per- we're persevering because Jesus Christ is coming back. That's why we are persevering. Listen, if you've been getting frustrated and listen, I, this is something for me as well. Listen, let's persevere. Let's take our eyes off of the external, all the things around us, and let's put them on the eternal. Let's put them on Jesus Christ because he is coming back for his church. Now, lastly, James tells us that we are to be faithful to our word in verse 12. It says there, but above all, brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any oath. He says, but let your yes be yes and your no be no. And then he says, lastly, lest you fall into judgment. Many of the Jewish people of this day that James wrote to were making distinctions between binding oaths and non-binding oaths. Basically, they would say if they, if they wanted to fulfill an oath, they would say, hey, that was a binding oath. You need to fulfill your word on that. But if, it was a, what, if they didn't want to fulfill their word or be faithful to their word, they would say, oh, that was a non-binding oath. Basically, it was like saying they had their fingers crossed behind their back and they weren't going to fulfill their word. They basically lied. And James is condemning of that type of behavior, not fulfilling the promises or breaking, you know, he's condemning people that are constantly breaking promises. Uh, There's a famous quote, and I can't say that I agree with it. At least I agree with half of it. And it goes like this. Promises and pie crusts are meant to be broken. Well, you might know which side I agree with, and you probably say amen to that. Pie crusts are meant to be broken as we are meant to be, or as we are meant to cut into them. But promises, when they are broken, oftentimes leave a trail of frustration. I heard a story of a Native American named Chief Joseph that was uh, going to be forcibly removed from his territory in, uh, I think it was northeastern Oregon by the United States uh, government. And he ended up fleeing with his tribe uh, to a northern territory in Montana, 64 kilometers from the Canadian border. And it was there that uh, Chief Joseph surrendered to the army with the understanding that he and his people would be allowed to return to a reservation in western Idaho. Unfortunately, he was instead transported between various forts and reservations, uh, moved several times, and eventually wound up in the state of Washington where he died in 1904. But there was a famous quote that he was quoted, or that he said, Uh, during the time in which he was being moved around while the the United States government was not fulfilling their promise. And he said this. He said, it makes my heart sick when I remember all the good words and all the broken promises. Now, to a degree, we experience, actually, we experience this to a lesser degree this last week. 
We were promised this last Monday that uh, restrictions were going to be relaxed if hospitalizations fell to under 400. And while there were only 250 people in the hospital, uh, restrictions were not relaxed to uh, the extent of which they were promised. And it left many people frustrated, irritated, uh, angry with, uh, with our government and so forth and because of the promises that were being broken. Warren Wiersbe speaks about James chapter 5 and verse 12. And he says, although it may seem out of place in the speaking of oaths, Many people have asked the question, what does this have to do with uh, the context of suffering in the light of Jesus' return? But if you've ever suffered, you probably understand this. Because there's oftentimes when we suffer, we make these bargains with God. Lord, if you just take away the suffering, then I will do whatever. You know, and then God takes away the suffering and he reminds us. Hey, you remember when you said that uh, you would start serving me and you'd stop doing this and you'd start following me wholehearted? Oh yeah, I did say that. Well, I said I would. I didn't say I would or that kind of thing. You know, we, you make bargains and we don't oftentimes fulfill them with the Lord. That's why it's dangerous to make bargains with God. Warren Wiersbe continues on and he says, it is the basic principle that the true Christian character requires few words. And he says, the person who must use many words, including oaths, to convince us that something is wrong with his, uh, he uses many words, it convinces us that something is wrong with his character and he must bolster this weakness by using many words. The true believer, if we are a true believer with integrity, then all we have to do is live out our faith and people will believe us. You know, there's so many times that people, you know, will try to convince you. You know, here's, here's what I am so thankful for, that I don't have to be a salesman for Jesus Christ. And listen, if you're a salesman, God bless you. But I'm, I am so thankful. I don't have the gift of sales. I cannot, listen, if I have to sell something, I wouldn't be able, you know, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't sell anything. I just, I'm not a salesman. And I am so thankful that I don't have to be a salesman for Jesus Christ. The Bible tells me to preach the gospel in season and out of season and to live my life in a way that Jesus is coming back. And listen, people will recognize that. Jesus once again said in the Sermon on the Mount, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Our world needs no more broken promises. Our world doesn't need to hear, you know, in so many words, I, the frustrations that are taking place. The world needs the church to live authentically with the authentic faith of the gospel and to shine with the light of Jesus Christ in these last days. Amen. Father, we thank you, Lord, for our time this morning. And Lord, we pray that you would bless your church, God. Lord, we pray, Lord, that you would uh, help them, Lord, Lord, persevere in these last days, God. Lord, help me persevere, God. Lord, we pray, Lord, that you would establish us, that you would strengthen us, Lord. Teach us to be patient in these last days, Lord. Lord, we pray, Lord, that the Spirit of God would empower us, Lord. We love you, Jesus. We thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you, church.